Hello and welcome to another episode of Find My Past Fridays, our weekly live show about all things family history and all things interesting to family historians. Uh, apologies for starting a few minutes late. I hope you weren't all sitting there in a blind panic thinking, what's happened to Max and Alex? No, we're okay. We, we, we're just a few minutes late. But yes, it's lovely to be back on a lovely sunny afternoon in the London office. We're really looking forward to a very, very hot weekend. Um, so yeah, tell us, let us know where you're watching from. How's the weather? What have you got planned for the weekend? Uh, we've got quite an exciting episode this week. So you may have seen in the um, post Max put on, uh, on our Facebook page earlier, but we have quite a special guest joining us this week. Uh, yeah, so our colleague Niall from our Dublin office was over this week and we hadn't actually planned on getting him up, but we thought, Niall's never here on a Friday, too much of a good opportunity to miss. So we thought we'd get Niall up to ask, answer a few questions about Irish family history. So yes, that is the main purpose for today's um, broadcast. Ask Niall anything. That is also our question of the week. If you have any questions about Irish family history, research tips, or if you'd just like, like to know what it's like working in our Dublin office, uh, get your questions in the comments. And very shortly, Niall will be joining me up here and we'll just be having a you know nice, gentle discussion about Irish family history. So yes, this week's broadcast is going to be a lot more interactive, so please do get involved, get those comments in, and I know it's shameless, but as always, give us a like, even better, give us a share, and we will love you forever. On that note, can you, for me... Oh yes, sorry, I should also so, add, we are joined by Max this week, but we only have a certain number of microphones, of course, Niall needs a microphone, so while you can't hear Max's dulcet tones, he, he is here, he is sat behind the camera, and he is keeping an eye on what's coming in. So I just want to say, can you say hello to so, Valerie, to Joe? Hello to Valerie, hello to Joe, hello to Audrey. And Lauren. And Lauren. Hello, everybody. Hello, one and all, and thank you for joining us. And we, Nick and Anita are just joining And us. Nick and Anita. Uh, yeah, hi to everybody. Uh, and don't forget, yeah, if you've got any Irish questions, start getting them in now, and we'll get through as many as we can in the time we have. But before I invite Niall up, I just wanted to talk about two other announcements, completely unrelated to Irish family history. They're both military ones, actually, but still important news that I wanted to share. The first was a rather exciting new, well, yet another exciting new search feature we've added to our family tree as of today. So you may remember, I think it was about two or three weeks ago, we announced a great fanfare that we'd added military hints to our family tree. So our family tree is now hint against our collection. I think it's over 84 million odd military records from around the world. Well, it's got even better today. Uh, this hinting, the military hints have been improved even further because now service number is now included in your hints. Uh, and that has quite a big impact and it's quite hard for me to do it justice just by explaining. So I wanted to show you, well, here's one I made earlier basically, so an, uh, an example I pulled out just to give you an idea of how, how, how powerful this tool can be. So the first image, which I believe Max will bring up now, is of um, not actually a relative of mine, it's a relative, I believe, of Estelle, who introduced military hints a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Charles Pierce was born in 1877 in London, and Estelle knew that he was in the Durham Light, Light Infantry, and she knew he served in the First World War. So she already knew a little bit about him. But she was very pleased, nonetheless, to see a mili well, not just one military hint, but many military hints pop up. So if you see that image there, there's one, two, three, four, five, like seven or eight hints, all bar one of which are military. But Estelle did know that he was he lived in Shoreditch. So if you see, I think it's one, two, three, four, five rows down, um, the location for that record is tagged as Shoreditch. So that's the one she decided to look at first. Second image, please, Max. So after reviewing the transcript and the corresponding images, Estelle was able to tick all the boxes and she was you know, pretty confident now that uh, this Charles Pierce was her Charles Pierce. So as you can see on this screen here, she starts to accept the hint and a new military fact is created. So can we get the next image up please, Max? So here you see the new military fact we've created. I and mean, if you look, you can see the service number 26841 has been added. And yeah, that's a really useful piece of information. That's something else that our hinting system can match up to all the other details it's captured and start looking for other records. So now this is where we get to the good bit. This is the really cool bit, I think. So now we take the service number from the fact and we use that to find more hints. So when we go back to the hints page, there's a new hint that Stell didn't have before. And if you look, so next image, please, Max. As you can see here, there's a 99% confidence oh. rating. Oh, I haven't got this image, so we'll have to, we'll have to imagine this one. So You'll have to imagine it. But anyway, the image that I came up. One, two, three, five. <laughs> 
basically max was missing image four, one, two, three, five. But if you were to see that image, it would show that there's a 90% match for that. So very successful. And then after reviewing the hint, which is image five, you can see um, you can see more matches coming up, which match his service number, which you know confirms to an even greater extent that it's him. So there you go. If you do, I, I, I do, I really do recommend using this feature and adding service numbers to your tree because you will find loads more records. I was also going to talk about the history of service records quickly, but I've realised it's a very complicated subject. I was talking to Paul Nixon, our military expert, about it this morning, and uh, I think we may have to get him up in the future weeks to talk about uh, service numbers because the, you know, the, 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 the ways they were used, the methods they were issued change a lot over the years and it's a subject we do need to look at more closely. But if you'd like to learn more in the meantime, I have to plug Paul's blog. Paul Nixon actually runs a blog dedicated entirely to army service numbers and it is, it's armyservicenumbers.blogspot.com. We'll pop a link in the comments to that, but if you want to know more about service records, it's one, there's not much information online and from what I've seen, this is the most authoritative source of information on service numbers out there so check it out so and last but not least before did you have something for me to yeah quickly i was going to say i'm not sure if you'll know the answer to this but audrey says if a man has more than one service number does it find them all so oh that's a question for george audrey i will ask george and we will get that posted in the comments that's a very good question can you repeat the question just in case sorry audrey asked if a man was issued them with more than one service number uh, because yeah, when they change regiments and things, new service numbers would have been issued. Does this new hinting system find all of them or does it focus on one? I myself don't know the answer. This was only introduced, I think, yesterday. Uh, so I will go and speak to George and I will find out. Uh, and on the subject of military, uh, this is more of a kind of rallying cry. Um, Lives the First World War needs you. I'm trying to imitate Kitchener there from the famous poster. I don't know if you got it, but anyway. Uh, Lives the First World War um, form, um, was a website that was launched in partnership with us uh, back in 2014 to commemorate the centenary of the First World War. And if you haven't been on there, it's amazing. The plan is that once the centenary period is over, it's going to stay online and act as a permanent digital memorial to all the millions of men and women that, you know, gave up, sacrifice, and, and contributed to the war effort in some shape or form. But Lives of the, world, Lives of the First World War desperately need your help to reach the 8 million stories benchmark. So at the moment, more than 7.6 million stories have been added so far. So there's a really good chance, even if you've never visited the site, there's a really good chance your ancestors are on there. Mine are, I didn't put them there. Um, but they really want to eat, reach the 8 million figure by November uh, this year, you know, the, the 100th centenary, the, the, the 100th anniversary of the armistice. So yeah, we need your help. Please, 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 if you haven't already, go on the site, search for your ancestors' profiles. If you have any records, if you have any information, if you have any photos, even if you have an anecdote or a memory about them, please add it and help, help them create this amazing permanent digital memorial, which will be a great legacy for future generations. And I just think it's a really great thing to be involved with. So that's my uh, campaigning out the way. Do get involved and do help. But now, I think that's enough of military now. Now for the main, the main event, Irish family history. Come on up, Niall. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Happy have, to be here. Have you done one of these before? Um, possibly. I can't remember. I do so much stuff. You've done, you've done loads of webinars and videos I've done and stuff before, and haven't things, you? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we thought, would not, now you come over about what, once a month? About once a but month, But it's yeah. never on Fridays. I'm, if I'm here on a Friday, I'm usually out by about lunchtime, so this is a... Rare misses all the that fun. I'm here for the afternoon, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no, we thought you, you obviously being a real life Irishman and working in, an, in our Dublin office, you know a hell of a lot about Irish family history. So I thought you could answer some questions. We've had some sent in, but I thought just before we actually read out some of the questions we've been sent, that have been sent in, really generally, I'm sure many people know, but Irish family history has a reputation for being notoriously difficult. Can you sum up why, fairly, you know, in a brief way? Yeah, well, I would always first of all say that, yes, it can be challenging, but the discoveries you make and the successes you have when you're doing Irish family history are actually so much more rewarding because it's a bit more challenging. So first oh, of yeah. all, it is a bit more difficult, but off. just get into it and anything you find, it makes it all the more rewarding. But the reason it is a slightly more difficult is because, well, there's a number of reasons, really. Um, first of all, most people, anybody who's ever really researched Irish family history will probably know about the fire in 1922 uh, yeah, in, the, in the Public Records Office of Ireland. And that destroyed millions of records going back hundreds of years for Ireland. So it's a massive loss for Irish genealogy 
one of the biggest losses from that fire was the 19th century census records. Yeah. So in the UK and in the US, you can go back in the, through the 19th century every 10 years. You can't do that with Ireland. You have to use census substitutes because only fragments from the 19th century Irish census survive. Um, another reason it can be a bit difficult is because um, co when comparing it with the UK, or England and Wales specifically, civil registration starts slightly later in Ireland. Yeah. So while it's 1837 in, the, in England and Wales, it's actually 1864 in Ireland, and apart from um, non-Catholic marriages, which is 18, 1845. Yeah, so that makes it a little bit more difficult as well, getting back that further. I mean, once you get past the 1860s, you probably are relying on parish records more than anything else. So you've almost got to, if you're starting out, you've almost got to go in at intermediate level because all the really beginner-friendly stuff that we're familiar with in UK family history just isn't there. Pretty much, yeah. You, you need, if you, once you get any deep into Irish, in Irish family history, you kind of need to look at parish records. And yeah. They're like the main source pre-1860s, I would say. And they're quite, there's quite a lot online at the moment, isn't there? More is being added all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're Catholic, or if your ancestors were Catholic, and obviously a huge percentage of, of people in Ireland were Catholic, and still are, um, we have 10 million Irish Catholic parish registers on Find My Past. They're free to access, and they cover the entire, the entire country. If they were Church of Ireland, which would be um, Protestant, um, that, that a lot less of them are online. We have certain small collections on Find My Pass, but actually the main archive for those is called the RCBL Library, and that is in That's Dublin. That's catchy, isn't it? Yeah, so I think it's the Representative <laughs> Church Body Library in Dublin. Wow, if I'm that not is mistaken. catchy. Yeah, so that's that, and a lot of their records are still in that archive. They're not actually online, so if you have Church of Ireland ancestors, you're probably going to be relying on them. They're, as you say, more being put online all the time, so it's worth always checking first. So it basically, the takeaway is, while it's difficult, it, it is very possible. Yeah, absolutely. And as I mentioned, census substitutes, that's what you're going to be looking for in Ireland in the 19th century. And you've century. got some really interesting ones There's as fantastic well, haven't ones, you? absolutely fantastic ones. Court records, prison records, uh, Griffith's valuation. There's all these things you can use to plug the gaps. So yes, the, if, if you hear people saying that Irish family history is difficult, I would say not difficult. I would say more challenging, but more rewarding. Yeah. Don't let it put you off. So if you do have success, some some major successes, it's more of a badge of honour. Exactly. I, I reckon so. Yeah. I, I like when, whenever we go to shows, I can never answer Irish questions. I'm you just like, point them to Niall, me. Niall, please <laughs> come help me. Uh, let's, let's go on some viewer questions. Yes, we've had a few viewer ones. questions. So um, we've had one in from Noel Margrave, uh, and I believe Noel would have liked to watch, but he's working, so he'll be coming back to you this. You can watch it back anytime, Noel. You, you can indeed, and he'd like to ask how he should go about finding out anything about his third time great-grandmother, Mary Ann Worrell, uh, who was born in Dublin in 1823 to John. So you're <laughs> struggling with the names there. She married George Charnock Nosco, 4th of July 1844 in Liverpool, uh, and died in 1813 in Carlisle, Cumberland. Any advice or help would be much appreciated. I would say if he has her marriage, I would start with that marriage certificate because with the marriage certificate, you should have her father's name on that and that should give you something to focus on when you go back to the Irish records in Ireland. It's 1823, so automatically, as I said, it's before 1860, uh, so yeah. you're going to be looking at parish records. Yeah. And then you have to find out if she's Catholic. If she's Catholic, you're obviously looking at the Catholic parish registers. If she's not Catholic, it'll probably be the Church of Ireland, maybe possibly even other ones like Quakers or whatever. Um, so hopefully her marriage certificate will give you that information and having her father's name will help you narrow it down. But I would start your search on the Catholic parish registers on Final Pass. Mm. So, I've, got, I've got a live one that's just come through actually from Joe Murphy. And I'll repeat uh, this. So Max is just saying we've got a live one coming through from Joe Murphy. I think people can hear me if I shout. Oh, <laughs> can they? Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, do you have any tips for common surnames pre-census? So shall I repeat that just in case? Just in case. Just in case. Do you have any tips for common surnames pre-census? Yeah, common surnames is one of those really common obstacles that yeah. people, people meet in Irish family history research. Um, I would say look for clusters of people. If you can get, it's all about location with, with Irish family history as well. So if you can get the family that you're looking for down to at least a county, if a, you can get them down to a parish or a townland, that's obviously better. But if you can get them at least down to a county, I would then look for clusters of that surname in the county and then kind of examine those clusters more closely, pick up the names. Um, obviously pre-census relates again to the 19th century stuff. So what you'd be looking for, you'd be using records like Griffith's valuation, um, landed estates, court rentals, court records, prison registers, anything that dates in the 19th century yeah. that you can use as a substitute for the censuses. But in terms of surnames, um, yeah, I would just say look look for clusters. Um, 
I know something like Murphy, that, Joe, that's your name. <laughs> that's really, sometimes it is really a needle in a haystack. You're looking for, I suppose, as many searches as you possibly can, cross-reference as many different records as you possibly can to try and pinpoint the right family. It's the only way you can go about it. It is painstaking, but it's worth it, as I said, if you can yeah. actually make the discovery. I should feel especially proud of yourself Absolutely, if you do yeah. as well. So, oh, we've got one in from one of our regular, regular viewers who is also not able to watch live because he's also stuck in work. William Shaw. Well, we're sorry you're stuck in work, William, and you hope we, you, we, we hope you catch us later. So, William has asked, um, I've got a copy of a birth certificate from Ireland with only the mother's name on it. Is there any way I can locate father's name? And if so, how? Um, well, this doesn't just apply for Irish family yeah, history, you get but this in UK yeah, as well, exactly. You? Um, the first thing I would say is probably look for a, a baptism record. Um, it might depend. Did it, was the year on that? No, he hasn't said the date. Um, it might. It'll depend when the date is. If it's around the time of either the 1901 or 1911 census, I would look at those because they survive in full. So I would look for the mother's name and who she's living with in the census at the time. Now, obviously, I don't know the date, so I can't and say. I guess it, is. it also depends whether the child was born illegitimately or not. We don't know whether she was married. Or exactly. Whether, yeah. yeah. You will see instances of that. That's probably that could be the reason why that he's the father's name is not on the birth certificate. Um, yeah, I would also look for other children born to that mother. Ah, uh, yeah, if there's any child. father's names on there, that would be another way to look at it and um, to see if you can match them up. Cool. So, and I, am I right in thinking as well that in, I know in the UK, I don't know whether it's the same in Ireland, but with a lot of illegitimate children, if the child has the sur same surname as the, ma the mother's maiden name, yeah, you know they're illegitimate, but I know a lot of English mothers, they'd, give, they'd make the middle name of the child the surname of the father even though they weren't married? Yeah, there's, there's a, a slightly different, um, I would say, unique kind of naming patterns that you'll, that you'll see through Irish records. And we have a good one, we have a good blog on this uh, actually yeah. on Find My Pass. So Max will pop that in the comments for you. But it's, it's really useful to just kind of see, watch that type of thing. It's usually the, ugh, I can never get this off the top of my head, but I think it's the paternal grandfather, first of all, and then the paternal father for the second child, and it goes through that way. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there's so a real structure to it? Yeah, there is, yeah. Oh yeah, we'll definitely have to pop that up because things like that are really handy indicators, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. So next up we've got a question from Rosie Murrell who says, I think it might be useful to make a mention uh, of the Anglic, 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 sorry, sorry Rosie, it's, it's Friday, it's been a long week. Anglicization, that's not how you pronounce it, but you know what I mean, <laughs> of uh, Irish first names and how they might show up in Latin on church records. I found the baptisms of my great-grandfather's siblings around 1860 um, Father Jeremiah, Mother Catherine. I'm fairly sure I've found his marriage uh, in roughly the right area. Same spouse, but under the original Irish spelling of Dermot. So that's more of a general twit tip. But the qu actual question is, is there a particular period in which the Anglicised names uh, are more, more likely to be found in records than original? So was there a period when people did start to change <laughs> Yeah, names? Well, well, if you think about it, like up until 1922, when we, um, there was partition between Britain and Ireland, Ireland was part of Britain, so all, all of the records would have been, have obviously the English influence over them, so the government records would mostly be, be in English. I get, yeah. It's slightly different with church records because you'd have Latin in there rather than Irish, so because the main language of the Catholic Church was Latin. Latin. So it's, it's more kind of what record you're looking at rather than a specific period, although you will see um, a lot of Anglicisation up until partition in 1922 when then Irish starts to be used again. Oh yeah, I, wow, that is, so... It's, a, it's kind You're of You're almost seeing I, I, the, the kind of cultural shifts in exactly, history. Exactly, in true to the names. Through yeah. family history records. Absolutely. It's crazy that, isn't it? Uh, so we've got another one from Sue Kelly. And Sue is, I think Sue's another regular viewer. Hello, Sue, if you're watching. Hi, Sue. Sue is saying, I have a marriage in 1817 noted in a will. James St. Lawrence and Catherine Powell. They were living in, can you pronounce that for me now? Tubber Curry. <laughs> I didn't want to accept that. <laughs> Tubber Curry Sligo. At the time of James's death in 1849, I have no idea where to find the marriage record. They were Protestants, and he was an inspector in the Inland Revenue Police at the time of his death. We've got some records for that, I think, haven't we? It was reported in many papers, really struggling with most, uh, with most Irish lines to get back beyond 1799. Yeah, well, the first thing I would say, and um, the reason you're probably struggling there, is you mentioned they're Protestants, and what I said is a lot of the Catholic parish registers are, registers are online and searchable. A lot of the Protestant ones, which are Church of Ireland ones, aren't. Yeah. So again, you're going to have to contact the RCBL library in Dublin. They have it like a genealogist on hand who are happy to um, 
give you advice on, on searching for Church of Ireland ancestors, but I think you can actually also pay them to do a search as well through the, through the records. And obviously, if you're ever in Dublin, it's a nice excuse to visit one of the archives there. And do you have any idea of cost? How much No, cost? not off the top of my head, but I know on, on their website, which I, I'll give to Max and he can pop in the comments, that they have a section just dedicated to genealogy, so if you drop them a note, they'll, they'll be happy to tell you. Right, chaps, you've got five minutes left. I've sent you through some bit shorter questions yes. that have come through live, so let's try and be... Barrel through pretty, this. Yeah, don't, you know, no hurry, but succinct. <laughs> <laughs> no hurry, but hurry, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, Robin Hancock. Hello, Robin. Hi, Robin. Uh, why would I not find a record of my grandfather's birth in Uri in, 187, in 1870? Been searching for this for years with no luck. Um, interesting. I, I, I do see this from time to time, that sometimes... I don't know why, but the, the, the birth has, it's a birth we were looking for, yeah? Birth, yeah. yeah. The birth just doesn't seem to have been registered. And obviously by this stage, civil registration has been introduced. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's could legal. Could be any number of reasons. Yeah, there, guess, there could be any reasons. Um, I would, I mean, you, if you have all these details and you've done the searches, you've exhausted that avenue, I would maybe search for siblings, just see what you, you can get there. Sometimes I've seen cases where you find all the siblings and there's just one missing. I don't, I can't say why that is. As you say, there's, there could be a number of reasons. But I would, the, the, what I would do in that case is, is search sideways and search for his siblings. Okay. Um, and this, uh, another one from, well, this one from Eric Anderson. This is a very nice general question. You'll be able to answer this in right. like one sentence. Uh, do, do our amazing Irish collections, <laughs> I added amazing. The largest collection The largest anywhere collection online. anywhere, yeah. Um, do our, does our Irish collection cover all of, our, all of the island of Ireland or just the Republic? <clears throat> so we, uh, from a records point of view, we take it as an all island thing. So like, as I said, up until 1922, the whole island was part of Britain anyway. Yeah. And so we don't have a speci specifically split out between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland today. Some records, depending on the repository that we've licensed them from, will be based on the Republic of Ireland. An example is the Irish prison registers. So they just cover all the, all the prisons in the 26 county um, of the Republic of Modern Day Republic of Ireland, and that's because we've licensed them from the National Archives of Ireland. The prison registers for Northern Ireland are either in the specific prisons or in Prony, the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. So you will okay. see, it depends on where we've licensed them from, but from our point of view, in terms of getting the records onto the site, we look at it from an All-Ireland perspective. I guess that, because that makes sense for, for people that, that when they're searching. Yeah, exactly, yeah. because the things like the 1901 and the 1911 census, Ireland was, par was one country then, it, it's, it wasn't partitioned, so they're, they're, they cover the entire island, and so, as do the Catholic parish registers. I get you. Oh, this one might be a hard one, Niall. Um, well, then don't <laughs> <look at> me. <laughs> It's too late, I've started. Uh, Samantha Ayres, uh, any tips for tracing orphans from Ireland to Australia and proving parentage? We, we get loads of questions about yeah. orphans. It's such a hard one. Yeah, orphans is a tough one. We have um, a great collection of Irish workhouse registers on the site. So the Dublin ones in particular, I've found my ancestors in them and they're fantastic, the amount of details you can give them. If they're orphaned, there's chances are they might have gone through, through the workhouse at some stage because obviously that was where anybody who was hitting hard times ended up. Um, I would start a search there. In terms of them going to Australia, there are some, I think on the National Archives of Ireland's website, um, which again, we'll pop in the comments for you. I think there are some transportation registers, but because they're um, an orphan, they may, probably weren't on there. They were more for convicts. Oh, yeah. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know of any specific um, transport or uh, shipping records that actually covered orphans specifically, but again, I yeah, I it's think a it, tricky one, it isn't it? Is, yeah. Without knowing the date and things yeah. like that. I would I would start your search in Ireland in the Irish records. Try some of the poor house records, the poor law records, the um, workhouse records, and see how you go on those. If they were in the Dublin workhouse, chances are we have them in that collection online and they're, they're fantastic. We've also got workhouse records, I think, from County Clare, County Sligo, and they're all exclusive to Point of Pass as well. Great, well I think we can squeeze in two more if, okay. you're, if we're quick. So um, this one is from Sue Puglia Eliza, that's a, a very nice name. Uh, my question for now is how I can find outgoing passenger records to immigrants for the US. My ancestor was born on the trip over and his mum died in childbirth and was buried at sea. So when they arrived, again, he, another orphan one, mm. he was placed in an orphanage. Any hints to find would help? So you're looking for the, the passenger list, really. Um, I would recommend, as a first port of call, um, a new collection. Well, not that new, but it's a few months on our side at the moment. It's called the British and Irish Roots Collection. Yeah, this is a massive collection of about 98 million records, and it's taken from various sources, so passenger lists, 
um, naturalizations, uh, even military records and census records, they're all poured into one and we've, we've done it because we want to make one collection that is really easy to trace immigrant ancestors from Britain and Ireland over to North America. So I would go in there and do a search first of all. Specific to that, again, the orphan thing, um, yeah, it, you would, you would kind of need to, it depends on the date first of all, again, we don't have the date so I can't say for sure, but it would depend on the date because they could be going through Ellis Island if it's New York. Of course, if there's other um, ports that they're arriving into in America, we have certain passenger lists on Final Pass as well, most of them for the East Coast, so Boston, Philadelphia and all of those. Um, have a look at those, um, do a general search maybe on just all the travel collections on Final Pass and see what comes up. Um, but it's an interesting kind of a scenario, yeah, that one. I guess you've just got to hope for the best and yeah. look, in all the, look in all the places you usually would. Yeah, British and Irish Roots collection, bullet. British and Irish Roots collection for something like that straight away would be the first thing that comes to my head to try. If that doesn't work, start going into maybe the more specific record sets if you have any information on where, they, where exactly they arrived into. Nice. Well, I think that takes us up very nicely to exactly 25 minutes. So I think, well, thank you very much, Nala. I hope, totally we can, I hope you're going to be doing these again in the future. <laughs> I must, yeah, yes, sir, if you've enjoyed it, Yes, if you'd like to see more, more, more of Niall and if you'd like more uh, Irish tips, please do let us know in the comments. You may have made a rod for your own back here now, <laughs> Niall. We may be dragging you in front of the camera on a very regular basis. Uh, and also, if you're watching this and it's not live, still, if you put your questions in the comments, we'll be looking at them before we next have an Irish. Yes, yeah, don't, don't, don't worry if, if you haven't caught the broadcast. Do keep your questions coming in because we don't ignore them. We will be coming back to them. The more likes and shares we get, yeah, the more chances I am. Of I like that. Office. Yeah, <laughs> bargaining. Scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. Thanks again, Nat. Have a lovely weekend, and we will see you again very soon. Bye. Bye.